In this video, I'd like to talk about fractal dimension. And before we talk about the dimension of these three fractals here, let's remind ourselves what dimension means in the usual sense. For instance, we have a point here, and we consider points to be zero dimensional objects. This is a line, and lines we consider to be one dimensional. For an object like a square or something in the plane, we consider these to be two-dimensional. And for something in space like a cube, this is considered to be three-dimensional. And with fractals, they usually do not have these whole number dimensions. In fact, their dimensions are usually between these numbers. For instance, this right here, this is the Coke snowflake, and the dimension of this is approximately 1.26. And we have to write it approximately since it's actually an irrational number. This comes from a logarithm, which we'll look at this in greater detail as we go, but most of these fractal dimensions will be represented as logarithms. And logarithms are usually not whole numbers. They're usually irrational. This object right here, this fractal, we call this the Menger sponge. And this one right here is called the Sierpinski triangle. Now, these two fractals we'll look at in greater detail in later videos. But for now, the dimension of the Menger sponge is approximately 2.73. And for this Sierpinski triangle, the dimension of this object is approximately 1.585. Now, an important question is to ask how these dimensions are actually calculated. And to figure that out, we first need to start with simpler shapes. Since remember that fractals are self-similar objects. When you zoom in on them, they look similar to the overall picture. And simple shapes have that same feature. If we were to cut up the line or a square or a cube into smaller pieces, those smaller pieces would look the same as the overall piece. And from that idea, we can notice a pattern. And then once we notice that pattern, we can apply those ideas to fractals and figure out how these are actually calculated. So let's make a little bit of room. And then we're essentially just going to start by looking at these simple shapes. And like I said, we will try to determine the pattern. So let's take each of these shapes and cut them into smaller pieces. And we can cut them into any size pieces that we want, but let's say we cut them into thirds. So with the line, we can cut this into three equal pieces where each piece is now one third of the original size line, and we have three pieces. For a square, we can do the same, but it's a little bit different. Each of these pieces is now one third of the original size, and we'll do it on each side. But when we split up a square into these pieces, we actually get several more pieces. In this case, we're going to end up with nine pieces, where each of these pieces has side lengths that are one third of the original size. And for a cube, it's similar to a square. We will take each of these sides and split them into one third of the original size. But with a cube, we will actually end up with 27 pieces. So let me draw this out very quickly. And with the cube, you can count these up if you want, but you can see that there are three rows of three cubes up top, and then you have three rows of that, meaning you have nine up top and three rows of nine, which is 27. And for all of these shapes, like I mentioned, we just took the original side lengths and cut them into three equal pieces so that each of these new pieces 
is one third of the original side length. And from this idea, we can notice a pattern relating the scale factor, essentially what we cut each of these pieces into and the number of pieces we end up with and the dimension. So let's define some variables. Let's say that our scale factor, what we're going to divide each of these original side lengths into, we can call this one over R, where in this case, R is equal to three. We can say that N is the number of pieces that we're left with after we carry out this process of dividing it up. And we can say that D is the dimension that we're dealing with. And for all of these cases, we know our scale factor, this one over R is one third, meaning that R is three. We know in this case, the number of pieces is also three, but the dimension is one since it's a line. And for the square, we know the dimension is two. It has that same scale factor, they all do. But in this case, the number of pieces is nine. And for the cube, we know the dimension is three and the number of pieces we end up with is 27. And somehow from this pattern, we can come up with an equation relating these ideas to each other. In fact, you might notice that in this first case, if we raise the scale factor to the dimension, we get the number of pieces. And this will actually be true for all three of these cases. If we take the scale factor, we raise it to the dimension, we get the number of pieces. And for this one, taking that scale factor of three, raising it to that third dimension, we get 27 since three times three times three is 27. And from this pattern, we can now use these variables to write an equation. We now have that R from the scale factor raised to the dimension is equal to N, the number of pieces. And this is the equation we'll use to determine the dimension of these fractal objects. So in the next video, we'll look at the dimension of the Koch snowflake since we are already a little bit familiar with that. And then in later videos, we'll look at the dimension of the Manger sponge and the Sierpinski triangle, as well as several other fractals.